Chapter 168 Sussex 2 Supermax Soon as the bus pulled in, we knew they had plans for us. We were considered as the worst as one can get. The worst of the worst of the worst of the worst. We were all being blamed for Ty's attempt to kill the captain. We were men who burnt down a cell block at Lorton, attempted to escape DC jail, then assisted in escapes and assaults of an officer at Youngstown, Ohio. Members and leaders of violent drug gangs and society involved in dozens of murders, including the killings of FBI agents, started a food strike in South One, destroyed Lorton, destroyed Youngstown, and was attempting to destroy Sussex One. It was 12 of us with the combined sentence of close to 1,200 years. 11 had a minimum of a 65 year sentence. I had a parole violation with 18 months left to see the parole board. It was around 100 officers in large cowboy hats waiting. Half of them were holding barking Rottweilers on leashes. We were being taken off of the bus one by one as a cadre of officers stood ready with weapons and snarling dogs. They called one homie name for him to stand up and the homie said, Come get me. I ain't going nowhere. The officer walked up and slapped him with his full force, yanked him by his collar and drug him out the bus. Once he got to the front of the bus, he threw him down the steps in which the other officers grabbed him by his belly chains and dragged him through the line of officers and rottweilers. One of the dogs grabbed his leg as he tried to kick him away. I guess they were trying to intimidate us. The same officer then called for the second prisoner to come up front and that was me. I stood up and took my small steps towards the front where he was standing because of the shackles were rubbing up against my ankle bones. As I got to the officer, he stepped on the chain that connects the shackles around my ankles, which caused the shackles to cut deep into my skin and rub more into my ankle bone. Then he pushed me backwards while holding on to the handcuffs and belly chains. I didn't fall. I was leaned back in a five minutes past seven o'clock position as he held on to the cuffs. This allowed him to have full control of me not being able to do anything. They were extremely paranoid not knowing if we had any more handcuff keys and knives that they just couldn't find. As I stepped off of the bus, hillbillies, black officers and rottweilers were lined up on both sides. I was led down the middle of the line escorted by three officers in battle gear, helmets, tasers, mace and batons. Two tasers were held against both of my shoulder blades. The place was also surrounded by numerous armed officers on guard. I was taken into a room with 10 of these officers and told to strip naked while they put on their black gloves and pulled the Velcro straps tight. They accused me of trying to stab one of their fellow officers. I'm pretty sure they accused us all. And of the killing of FBI agents in DC. They threw their frivolous threats everywhere, so I sunk into my subconscious mind letting the physical deal with the supposed psychological torture tactics. I learned from studying George Jackson. I became indifferent to the threats and the punches to my body. Nothing hurts. I learned this from Charlie Moe and Benny Lee. I was naked and surrounded by armed men in all black and I wasn't intimidated. They demanded I call them sir. No sir, I will not call you sir. The body punching continued. I blocked as many as possible while dishing out what I could. After a couple minutes, I was laying naked on the ground taking kicks to my body from big black steel toe boots. They then retreated to the next room, I guess to hand out the same kitty retribution. We were given clothes, cuffed and shackled and went on the identical dragon and long walk to the hole as Sussex won. The prisons were built identical, just this one was exclusively for DC prisoners and we were the first prisoners sent there. The other one was just for Virginia prisoners. We were taken to the hole in this supermax prison with specific instructions. 
No talking. No reading material aloud. No banging on the doors. No canteen phone calls or visits. If any one of these rules were broken, they would take our mattresses and we would be put on four-point restraint until we complied. I guess they planned on breaking us. They were wasting their time. Chapter 169 OBE I had a dream last night. What do you dream about? I dreamt I was sleeping. After months of pitch quiet with the exception of men screaming out while on four point restraint, I realized I spent a lot of time talking to myself. I didn't have any writing materials to capture my thoughts and the only book they were willing to give us was the Bible. I refused. I understood the goal of indoctrination. I understood that my enemies would only give me something beneficial if it was more beneficial to them. I understood that my enemies would never give me something that would help me to be a better person, only something to make me subservient to them. I would only tear the pages out and use them to cover the light. I continued to work out hard while walking back and forth between sets and the brightly lit empty room, looking forward to the sun shining through my window so I could suck up some of its energy. I was deep into daily meditation. It was the best place for me to get into myself, specifically because it was so quiet. 24 hours a day you could hear a pin drop. The silence was deafening, yet delightful. Not hearing any sounds for hours upon hours upon hours was strange. Silence had its own sound. The sound of nothing. The sound of heartbeats. The sound of thought. The struggle. Pushing thoughts out of my mind was a constant struggle. Trying to clear my mind of thoughts was harder than playing chess. But once it was cleared, the body reacted immediately. I felt my breathing pattern change. It was shorter breaths of inhalation. My mind was clear of any thoughts. I felt a sense of calm. I could hear my thoughts in the distance. I could hear the clouds moving. I could hear the grass shivering and the insects burning underneath me. I could hear the whispering chatter of officers in the distance. I would stare out the window at the shiny chrome fence, the sun and the bright green trees, the colorful skies, the gun towers and concertina wires. I touched the window then pushed on it to see if it would give. It stood still as a statue. It didn't budge. I sat on a steel bunk and stared at the pale white walls. I yearned for some crayons. I craved for the companionship of a friendly spider or a small army of ants. I stared at the ceiling in the background while floaters swam in the foreground of my eyes like Roman candles. I got up and walked to the cell door and stared at the officer with the pale skin holding the shotgun. She was looking directly in my eyes. The gun was too heavy for her so she had her right leg arched outwards on its tippy toe with the gun butt rested on her upper thigh. I wonder was it even loaded. I wonder if I could get to her and take it before I'm shot. We kept staring at each other but not in a menacing way. I took a step forward and I looked around. Oh shit. I was the only person on the tear and she wasn't panicking. She seemed calm and comfortable. The other officers in the bubble didn't even look my way. I knew I wasn't supposed to be out of my cell. It was like asking to be killed. I didn't have a weapon to defend myself. I wonder how many shots could my body take before collapsing. They're gonna have to attack soon. It was protocol. What the hell was I doing out of my cell? I said, fuck it. If I die, I'll die on my terms. So I took my chances by walking down the tier to my homie's cell. All the time, 
watching her. I needed to check up on him because he has been on four point restraint consistently. He had only been off of it for three days since we've been here. I looked in and I saw him tied to the steel bunk, face up, spread eagle staring at the ceiling with tears running down the side of his cheeks. I wanted to call his name or knock on the door to let him know somebody was there for him, but I didn't want to alert the other officers. I waved at him to get his attention, but his eyes were blank. It was nothing there. He had sunk into his subconscious to remain conscious. I decided to walk down the tier to the mop closet and check to see if it was open, but it was locked. I went in. I needed a weapon. I could dismantle a mop ring in minutes and find a hidden steel treasure that could be sharpened in an hour to make a beautiful carved ice pick. I needed a knife. I planned on killing at least one of the officers that beat me. The day I made it to population, I will murder the first cop I saw. Oh shit. She was looking at me now. Shit. She was watching me in the mop closet, but she hasn't adjusted the shotgun to aim at me yet. Maybe she's one of those white women that love black men and hated injustice. Or maybe she's waiting for me to get far enough away from my cell so when they open fire, it would be impossible for me to run back to the safety of the room. I felt for anything loose that could give hope of maybe escaping or constructing a weapon. After a few minutes, I understood why we were sent here. All of those ideas were taken into consideration before the construction of this prison. Nothing was left to chance that could be used for a weapon. The mop ringer had no pieces of metal and it was constructed with soft plastic and made all in one piece. The plastic was too soft to penetrate enough skin and muscle to cause any harm if it was sharpened. It was useless to make a weapon out of. I decided to walk back to my cell since it was nowhere to go and nothing to destroy. I kept my eye on her and she did the same to me. I again looked into the homie cell and saw piss on the floor. It was dripping from the bottom of the mattressless steel bunk. I kept walking. The homie in the cell next to him was standing in the middle of the empty cell staring down at his toes. I kept walking. The man in the cell next to him had bit off all of his fingernails and were using them as toy cars, racing them around the cell while making engine noises. I stared at him for a brief second, and then I kept moving. I entered back into my cell and looked at my body laying in my bed. It looked dead, but it was breathing, taking deep breaths, struggling to breathe. I stepped towards it closer to get a better look at this stranger invading my space, and to my surprise, it was me. It was my body in the bed that I was looking at. I touched myself, but I didn't wake up, so I pushed on my body real hard until I awoke. My eyes were bloodshot red. I was sweating profusely and breathing extremely hard. I sat up and stared at the walls. Man, what the fuck just happened? I was confused. I was trying to make sense of what just happened. Why am I soaking wet? And why is my heart racing? Oh shit. I just had an OBE. I walked to the cell door and looked out. As I got there, it seems at that exact moment, the officer turned to look at me in the cell door window while still holding the shotgun resting on her upper thigh. We locked eyes for a full five seconds before she passively released a subtle smile before turning her head. I wondered was she aware of what just occurred. I tried again to walk through the door, but it stopped me. I pushed on it, but it didn't give. I felt around a secured glass window for a small gap I could exploit, but nothing presented itself. All of a sudden, she looked back at me as I was feeling around the cell door window and smiled again before resting the shotgun onto a platform and walking to the other side of the bubble. I wondered was she suddenly handed me the shotgun? Or did she know at this time I couldn't get out of the cell? If so, then she knew I was just out of my cell. Spiritually. I yelled down to the homie on four point restraint, but he couldn't hear me. Damn, I actually had an OBE, I thought to myself. 
I just had a fucking OBE. Because it was so intense, I didn't even know that I was having an out of body experience, even though I studied them and I knew they were extremely vivid. But when it actually happened, I was completely caught off guard. I was free. I was free, but my mind was so institutionalized into slavery that even my out of body experience didn't leave the prison. If my spirituality was trapped along with my physical, then I was a dead man. And if my physiology was intertwined with my psychology, then I was going psycho. I wondered, was I going crazy? Maybe I am. I could have went and checked on my parents. I could have went and saw Charlie Moe. I could have visited Sierra. I could have checked on Benny. I could have gotten personal information on those pigs that disrespected me so I can avenge my pain once I'm released. I could have just enjoyed my freedom. This is what we were trying to conquer, to control and have full navigation of an OBE. Dreams are mostly random, but if a dream could be controlled, then the power that lies within it is unstoppable. I wanted to see the sun up close. I wanted to touch it knowing nothing was impossible in the spiritual realm. I laid back on the bed and was angry at myself for not knowing that I was having an OBE and not enjoying my chance of physical and spiritual freedom. I was livid. I decided to try again. I figured I could go back to my OBE, but it never happened. The potential freedom never came back even after deep mental cleansing, even after deep focus even after the total clearing of the mind, even after weeks of meditation. I was constantly fighting for freedom, but I was disappointed in myself. <laughs>